Discover hope and healing from the other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Welcome to another episode. I'm really excited about this. Every so often I have a guest who has had a near-death experience, and that's the case with my guest today. I love these stories because they help all of us understand more about what awaits us and who we are right now. I'm fresh out of a reading I did this morning for a woman whose mother and aunt came through so clearly. The evidence was off the charts, and her aunt's funeral was yesterday. So there was just no delay in her letting everybody know she's fine. Beautiful, magical moments. And I just continue to glow all day from that connection. I hope that you will be uplifted by our guest. He is Dr. Tony Sicoria, MD, a practicing orthopedic surgeon who has a stunning, stunning story to share with you. I'm going to let it unfold rather than read your biography. Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, we met a couple of times at a conference of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, and I'm so grateful you're going to share your story with everybody here. So let, I'm going to ask my guides where we should begin. They say, dive right in. So if you don't mind, I haven't let out the cat out of the bag of, of the changes that you experienced after your near-death experience, but would you please dive right in and tell us what happened that took you across the veil? Sure. Um, I was at a family reunion. Um, every August, we would have a, a communal birthday party because there were so many people in our family that had birthdays. We would just pick one weekend and celebrate it uh, out of convenience. And this particular day in August of 1994, um, we were all 25 or so people at this at a big pavilion next to a lake. It's called Sleepy Hollow Lake. It's kind of an ominous place to begin with. Yeah. Um, and in the morning, it was a beautiful day. Um, and my job for that morning was to run the barbecue. And so I was outside running the barbecue. I wasn't paying attention to what was happening with the weather and what I didn't realize was that a, a storm had brewed up over the lake and I was completely oblivious to it. Um, I, had, I had been out at the barbecue and I decided to give my mom a call and I walked around the front of the, the building and I was in the back of it uh, next to the lake. And I walked around the front because I had a payphone attached to the pavilion that we were in. A and what is that? I, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, this is be, this is before cell phones. This is crazy. Yeah, sure. Um, and I I dialed the phone, and I let it ring five, six, seven times, and she didn't pick up. And I thought, all right, well, I'll try again later, and. I went to hang up the phone and I, I had taken the phone a little bit away from my face and all of a sudden I heard a huge crack and this big flash of light came out of the phone and hit me in the face and it threw me back like a rag doll and as I was flying backwards I had this very strange sensation of moving forward and I was absolutely confused. I, I remember standing there and I'm thinking, okay, I was completely aware of everything that had happened. And I knew I'd been hit by lightning and I was standing here now and I'm looking around and trying to make sense of what was going on because I knew I'd been thrown backwards, but I had this strange feeling of moving forward. And now I'm just standing here, and, I, and I'm looking at the phone, and it's dangling. And right about then, I, in, you know, in my utter confusion, all of a sudden I hear my mother-in-law screaming, and she's up at the top of the stairs, and I'm at the bottom. And, and 
she's running down the stairs screaming and I'm thinking this can't be good. You know, when your mother-in-law is screaming at you, there's something it's a, not a good situation. And as she was coming down the stairs, I'm looking at her. I'm going, she's not looking at me. She's looking off to her left. Oh, wow. And as she got down right in front of me, it was like I didn't exist. And she took off to her left, and I turned to follow her to see where she was going. And she took a few more steps, and I took a few steps in her direction. And suddenly I was confronted with myself on the ground. Oh, there's my, uh, my second goosebump moment. I mean, Tony, this is straight out of the movies, but this is, the movies are reflecting reality here. Yeah, and I was absolutely dumbfounded. And, and I remember thinking in my usual vernacular, oh, shit, I'm dead. Huh. Huh. And, and I'm, I walked over to the body. And then it, it was, there was a lady who, who was waiting to use the phone behind me, and she started to get down to do CPR. And it, as it turns out, she was a nurse. And how fortuitous is that? And, and this place is in the middle of nowhere. Um, and and so I'll, get back, I'll come back to that. But um, so I, I'm standing there, and... And she's getting ready to start what she's going to do. And, and you know, my mother-in-law is crying and people are, are screaming. And I'm standing there and I'm trying to talk to them. And nobody can see me and nobody can hear me. And I'm thinking, okay, so nobody can see or hear me. But I'm standing here and I'm thinking, but I'm thinking like I normally would. I'm even thinking in the vernacular that I would normally think. And, and suddenly it came to me, whoever I am, I always am. And whatever this thing is on the ground, it's nothing but an empty shell. And whoever I am, I always am and have been forever. And, and that was an incredible realization for me that my soul, my spirit, continues on and at that point I thought well there's no point in standing around here I decided I'm going to go up to the second floor where my family was and see if I can find out where they are and what's going on now I hate to interrupt you here but we will get back to this story but I, I I'm just making an assumption you know about my story that I'm on this path because my stepdaughter was struck and killed by lightning I don't know if you know that yeah I do and as you tell this story, I had to take a deep breath because what you're telling me, my Susan never told me from across the veil, but I'm suddenly picturing her there as people were doing CPR on her body. And I know that my husband Ty is listening and I hope that it brings him comfort to know that she was standing back watching just like you did. And that all of our loved ones who are tragically struck down in an accident or whatever, it's the same scenario. I, just before you move on, I'd like to ask you, in that soul awareness, did you look down and were you aware of the you that was observing looking at hands or a body? Of um, I did. Um, initially, I had what appeared to be a body, um, but in, in a far different form. But... It, I had what appeared to be arms, legs. Okay. Um, and then when I turned and started to walk toward the stairs, um, as I started to go up the stairs, and normally I would look down at the stairs because I don't want to trip and fall on my face. Um, but as I was, as I, as, at about the third step, as I'm looking down, I suddenly see my legs start to dissolve. Oh. And I thought, okay, this is getting really crazy. And by the time I got to the top of the stairs, I had lost all form. And I was just a ball of energy. And instead of following the stairs up that went to the left, I went through the wall and passed directly over my wife's head 
um, she was sitting on a, a couch and she had children all around the front of her. She was painting children's faces. And I made a specific note of where the kids were and in what alignment um, and how many there were. And, and I was able to verify all that information afterwards. Beautiful. And as, as I was continuing through the room, it seemed, felt like I was going on a diagonal through the room. And when I got outside of that building, things really started to change because suddenly I was immersed in this bluish white light. And it was the most unbelievable thing I've ever felt any time in my life. And if you can imagine absolute love and absolute peace, that's what this energy was that I had just dropped into. And it and it reminded me of a of a of a stream flowing. And I had fallen into this this energy and I could see that this energy had form. I could actually see the waves in the energy. And and I remember thinking to myself, this is something I could measure. Huh. And and I thought this is the energy of God. And when I looked around, I could see that this energy flowed through everything and is what made everything. And, and I was just, I was absolutely astounded by it. And, but it was such a pure, pure sensation of absolute love and absolute peace. And, I, and, I do I do want you to continue this story, but I'm so aware of the majority of my audience is listening because they have someone who passed and they want to know more. And so what was your feeling now? You you realize you died, but you're seeing your family and what I know that we worry about our loved ones being scared for us or worrying about us, those left behind. Did, did any of that go through your mind yet? Um, the only thing that that came to me as I was um, as I was going out of the building and into the the stream was that I was told that everyone would be fine, everything would be okay. Okay. And you know what? I wasn't supposed to worry about it anymore. And at that point, I just accepted what was happening, and and I remember thinking this is the most glorious feeling anyone could ever imagine. And I was really excited about where I was going. I could feel a sense of speed and direction. I had no idea where I was going, but I could sense that I was going someplace. And then I, I saw what appeared to be a collage of high points and low points in my life and just pictures of, of, of times and, and, places and it really didn't have any meaning or any in-depth discovery it was just the pass by um, as kind of oh by the way <clears throat> and then right about that point I remember thinking this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to anyone and I was just absolutely ec ecstatic about where I was going what was going to happen next and then it was like somebody flipped a switch. And suddenly I was back in my body and I was so angry oh boy. I, because I, I went from being absolute bliss to absolute pain. Huh. And I remember, you know, as I'm lying there in my body now and I'm, I'm angry and I'm I'm, you know, talking to God, angels, anybody who will listen, please don't make me do this. Hmm. And, uh, and then I was just kind of given the realization that, you know, it's not my choice. And, you know, I don't have, I don't have the option to, to go back to where I was. And it was very painful where the lightning had hit me in the face. I had a burn and where it came out my foot, I had a burn and felt like, there were two hot pokers that were just sticking in me. Yeah. And I, I laid there for another probably 15 minutes before I was even conscious enough to say anything. And, you know, they called the, the police and, 
an ambulance. And I, at that point, I, I was, you know, awake and stupid. And I said, I'm not going to the hospital. There's no point in that. Uh, because, you know, when you get struck by lightning, you're either alive or dead. There's not much in between. Were you already a physician at this point? <laughs> yes, I was. Okay, so that was against your own medical, or that was your own medical <laughs> advice, huh? Uh, wow, you seriously was, did not go to get checked out? I know, I, you know, I, I just, as I look back on it, I think, boy, that was one of my all-time stupid moves. Okay, good. Um, but, you know, that was... That was the way I felt about it at that point. And I had my family take me home. I saw my, my cardiologist and my neurologist. When I got home, I called them and told them what had happened. And, and they took me right in. And, you know, they ran all the, all the appropriate tests and said, well, you know, if you're lucky. You know, and most people would never survive this. And, uh, and uh, you know, I had some some memory issues for uh, for about a week where I could I could look at you and and know who you were but boy I couldn't find your name any place mm -hmm. and it was like there was somebody had kicked over all of the files in my brain and and it had scrambled them all up and over over the course of a week to two weeks that all just disappeared and and I went back to work and I remember thinking, okay, I just went through just this incredible experience. Now, what in the world did it mean? And I was beside myself because, you know, I thought about, well, what's the probability of, of a building getting struck by lightning and absorbing enough of the amperage that you don't get fried at the other end? And then what's the probability of there being a nurse standing there in the middle of nowhere waiting to use the phone so that just in case you got a little too much, she was there to pull your butt out of the fire. And I thought, okay, this was clearly orchestrated, you know, from, you know, everything that I had ever thought about and realized that, okay, there's, there's something meaningful about all of this and it's up to me to figure it out. So I want to interrupt uh -huh. you a second. Most of you are listening, but for those who will be watching the video of this later, while you were talking, Tony, the, the light in the window behind you, the sun must have come from behind a cloud because it suddenly just intensified and this huge glow went around you as you were talking and it pulsed a little and then it pulled back again. And so I have to ask you, did you take with you that remembrance of this amazing light that you became a part of? Absolutely. I, I feel it all the time. Oh, boy. How about was that noticed in those around you? Let me back up a second question. Did you share, what did you share with your wife, your family about your experience? Um, I, you know, I told them some of it um, at first. Um, I kept a lot of it close to the chest um, because this was in the middle, you know, in the early nineties. And this was, it was not something that you could do. You know, if as a physician, if I was, if I walked around telling everybody, Oh, I got struck by lightning. I had this out of body experience and, and, and all these other things that happened. The first thing that would happen is somebody would call the state and say, you better take this guy's license away because he's it. lost it. And so, you know, there was a certain amount of, of pressure to just be quiet about it. Um, so, you know, just immediate family and, and very close people uh, are the only ones I really talked about it to. Um, but then that, that seemed to, to extend quite a bit because, you know, there were, I would run into people who needed help. Ah. Um, somebody was dying and, you know, the, um, and I would become aware of it and I would go and I would talk to them and I, and I would tell them, you know, some of my story. Um, and other people would contact me and say, can you go talk to this person? Um, and so, you know, there was, 
there was a certain cloud of information that was that was circulating around me, um, and then so at, at within a very short period of time after the after the lightning, it was a couple of weeks afterwards. I started to have this incredible desire to hear classical piano music, which was a big departure for me because I was a kid of the '60s and it was rock and roll, and there really wasn't much else. Um, I did have um, compulsory piano lessons when I was seven years old. Uh, my mother insisted on, and, and that was the end of that discussion. Um, so I, I took it for a year and had no use for it. Um, it was too busy with everything else in life and never paid another bit of attention to it. And so I, I really had no inkling um, or, or desire to, to be involved in any kind of classical music. So, but, so this was a big departure of, uh, for me, had wanting to hear classical piano. And so it let was me so just back up a second and, and just share with everybody that before we went on the show, you were sharing with me how your father told you you're going to the Citadel in South Carolina for college or don't come back home. So for four years, you had a very strict military education. That's right here in South Carolina where I live. And then you went, you got a PhD in science. Yep. And Physiology. then your medical degree. Yeah. And, then I, and then I went to medical school after that. Okay, so no music in there. You're not making music. You're not playing music. No, no, I was... I was absolutely consumed with education and, uh, and there really wasn't anything else in my life. Okay. So, so now a couple of weeks after your near death experience, you say you start having an interest in classical music. How did that play out? Um, it was, it was, it was more than just an interest. It was, I was being driven to, to hear classical piano and, it was overwhelming to the point where I, I had to drive to a place that sold classical CDs, which you know I was in. We lived in a small town called Oneonta, New York, and the nearest place that would even have music like that was in Albany, the capital. So I, I drove to Albany and I went into this music store and and a CD. Um, of Vladimir Ashkenazi, who was a famous Russian pianist, um, playing his favorite Chopin. It seemed like it jumped out of the shelf right, on right into my hands. And I thought, okay. Um, and so I bought the CD and, um, and I started listening to it and I was absolutely consumed by it. I listened to it nonstop, made everyone else listen to it. Um, and, you know, I, and I'm sure that everybody thought he's going off the deep end here. Um, but, you know, it, it was, for some reason, was very important to me. And within a couple of weeks of, of getting that music, I realized that it wasn't going to be enough to listen. I had to know how to play this music, wow. which was a big problem since I didn't have a piano and I didn't know how to play. Um, but the next day after that realization, one of our babysitters came by and said, I have to move. And I had this old piano and I was wondering if I could store it in your house for a year. Oh my gosh. There's the goosebumps again. <laughs> yeah. And it was, you know, it was like, okay, this is a little too weird. Um, you know, I had this thought and suddenly the piano appears. And so I, I bought some books on how to teach myself how to play. And I bought the music on from the CD. And I was determined to somehow magically learn how to play this stuff. So we have a um, minute and a half before the break. I really want to hear how this unfolded, but I'm trying to put myself in your wife's shoes. So the piano doesn't go in the basement. It goes where? In your living room, dining room? Yeah, in the living room. Yeah, and now all of a sudden, did you describe it to her like a compulsion? Um, it was more like I was obsessed. Huh. Did um, she recognize that? 
Oh yeah, that was that was her. You know, her description of it was, "You are married to your piano, and you're not married to me." Oh wow! So, wow! And 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 that was true. I mean, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, one of the one of the casualties to all of this was we wound up getting divorced. Um, and I think that the music um, had a large part in that because I I had my work, um, which I did, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. And then as soon as I got home, I was at the piano. Wow. And I was, and I was there four or five hours every night. All right. So this is leaving us with a cliffhanger. Wait till you hear how this played out. I said it before and realized that's a good pun, Tony. So we're with Dr. Tony Sicoria, who shared his near-death experience. Now wait till you hear what happened as a result of that. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. I hope you're enjoying this interview as much as I am with Dr. Tony Sicoria. You don't have a book, Tony. You don't have a website. What's um, that all about? The, the book is halfway done. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the website I have held off on making mostly because I wasn't quite ready um, to do that. But the reason I haven't published a book yet is because there was a lot of discovery that I had to go through in terms of trying to understand this. And I spent a lot of time trying to learn quantum physics and how it relates to the universe and how near death fits all into all of these um, different theories. And uh, and I think that I, it's finally starting to come together, uh, which is well, why we, I've... We will, you're going to have to let everybody know, because I know we will gobble it up. So I, I, I want to hear all of that now, but we have, to, we have to tell everybody how this obsession with playing the piano unfolded for you. So anyway, one of the, one of the casualties that... Uh, that came out of the music was well, we wound up getting divorced. Um, but eight years later, we wound up getting remarried again. Oh. Um, and I think that the, for me, I had swung so far off of out of balance and, and music became everything. And it took me years to be able to manage what the music was and so to continue on that on on the music about a month after the piano got there i have a dream and in this dream it was like an out-of-body experience i'm i'm walking out onto the stage and i see myself at a performance hall and I'm at the piano playing. And as I'm walking toward myself, I'm thinking, okay, what is what am I playing? And as I as I'm walking up toward myself, I realize that this is not somebody else's music. This is mine. And I thought, whoa. So I, I, I listened to the music and the the end of the music had a kind of a loud crashing ending and I woke up at the end of that piece and I sat up on the edge of my bed and I look at the clock and it's about 3.15 in the morning and I walked out to that piano and, and I had no idea how to play it at that point and I didn't know how to write anything but I, I just kind of plunked some of the notes thinking, you know, maybe I'll be able to remember some of this um, tomorrow. Um, and as and I went, But I gave up and I said, this is crazy. I'm going back to bed. I've got to go to work. So I went back to bed and I got up and I went to work as normal. 
but the one thing that was different was that music from the dream would play in my head. Whenever I sat down at that piano, the music would start playing. Wow. And, and then if I didn't pay attention to it, it would start playing when I was trying to do other things. Wow. And I thought, okay, it reminded me of a, like a little two-year-old. It's like, hey, daddy, pay attention to me. And, you know, at, and so I wound up paying attention to it. Um, and I would try to, to write down little snippets of, of things that I, that I heard, that, but I didn't know how to write music. And so it was, it, was a, it was very difficult. But so I started on this pathway to learn how to play. And I invested about a year and a half of, of time, you know, four or five hours a day trying to teach myself. And I realized that this is an exercise in futility. Um, and I contacted... Uh, my piano teacher, Sandy Campbell McCain, who was at the time was the, the chair, chairman of music at Hartwick College. Um, and so I called her and I told her the story and I asked her if she would take on an old guy student. And, uh, and she said, well, you know, bring me some music that you're trying to play and and oh boy. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an audition. And so, you know, I brought a few pieces of music um, that I've been trying to work on. And I played them. And she said, she said, okay, I will take you on as a student under one condition. I do not want to hear you play any of that music again until I say you can. And I thought, okay. And the explanation was, I had no building blocks with which to be able to tackle that level of music. Okay. And so Good she, lady. yeah, I mean, she started me out right at the bottom, um, fingering scales, you name it, all, you know, as much as, as much of all the basic stuff as you can stand. And, but while I was doing that, the music continued to play in my head and I would, continue to write down little snippets of things that I heard and I would stuff it all in a drawer thinking someday I'll come back to this. And as time went on and I became more proficient, I joined a, a piano camp for adults called the Sonata um, in Bennington, Vermont. And once, once a year I would go to this, this group and, you know, it was nothing but people who, were absolutely obsessed with piano. Um, so it was a common mind sort of a place, which was pretty interesting. Um, and I started in 2002. And then in 2006, I was trying to decide whether to go in my usual May uh, group, which is when I went. And I had, I after the, after the lightning, I had been to see a psychic medium, uh, Linda Dickinson, who I've, I had been seeing regularly after the lightning and trying to make sense of all of this. And it just happened that my appointment with her was in February. And I walked in and sat down. And she said, tell me you're going to the music camp this year. And I said, well, I hadn't decided yet. And she said, you have to go. Boy. There's somebody very important that you are going to meet. And I was like, okay, so I'll go. Um, so I, I went in May of 2006. And when I, um, when I went there, the owner's sister, Erica Vanderlyn Feiner, Erica had been the number one Steinway salesperson in New York City for years. And she had jumped ship and went to Bosendorfer. And she I brought in... We're going to bring up Bosendorfer. Okay. She, she brought in six or seven pianos for us to play on. And we got talking and, and she said, 
you know, I was telling her the story about the music and she said, you know, there's, there's only one person that can tell this story and that's Oliver Sacks. And I said, and at that point, I didn't really know who Oliver was other than the fact that he had written the book Awakenings. Um, but Oliver was a famous neurologist in New York City. And he'd written many books. Um, and he was famous for um, having all these case studies. Um, and so after I talked to her, I didn't think anything more of it. And then in July of that year, I get a call from Oliver Sacks. Oh, the and, psychic medium was spot on. Yeah, 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 it was pretty crazy. And Oliver said, you know, I, I've heard about this story, and I was wondering if I could have you come down to New York to be interviewed because I'd like you to be one of my patients. And so I absolutely. So in, in August, I went down and spent a full day with um, one of the greatest minds in the world, um, Oliver Sacks, and we we spent a full day talking about all this stuff. And as I'm standing at this door getting ready to leave, he's shaking my hand and he looks me right in the eyes like he's looking through me. And he says, the music from the dream went through an awful lot of trouble to get here. The least you can do is write it. Oh boy. And I was, I was so taken with that. When I, well, as soon as I got home, I went to a store and bought a music writing program called Sibelius. So it's writing music for dummies. And clearly, I, that's what I was. I had no idea how to do this. Um, but then he, you know, he was like always on my shoulder saying, do it, do it. Um, and so I spent the next seven months um, every night you know, writing down everything. And it was always easy for me from the standpoint that the music from the dream always played exactly the same. And so I, if I wrote something in the computer on using that program, I would then play it and then listen to what it was supposed to be in my head. And it was either right or it was wrong. And, you know, there were some, there were some difficult things that, that I had to deal with that I had no idea how to do. Um, but I, you know, went to my piano teacher and I'd say, you know, this is what I'm hearing and I don't know how to write it, you know, and she'd listen to what I'd say, well, that's five on four and, and this particular thing. And it's like, you got to do this and that. I'm like, okay. So, so I, before this program, I did watch you playing lightning sonata at the Mozart house in Vienna. <laughs> is that the song that was playing in your head? Yes. That's it. That's and it. it's a 16 minute video, a three part sonata. You have no sheet music in front of you. And you've just explained to me how that's possible because you couldn't get it out of your head. No, no, it was, it was burned in. And, uh, and huh. that was, that was one of the things that, that came out of all of this was that um, I got to play that music at Mozart's home in the basement theater that he had, um, which was an incredible experience. Um, Can you play it in, just like it's yours, you, it, but you don't take credit for it. I, I don't take credit for it because it was, it was given to me in this dream. And it was very clear to me that, you know, that it wasn't something I sat down and, and made up. It was, I, however it was given to me, it was like it was downloaded into my brain and from where it came um, or is it a frequency? Is it someplace um, that we can all get to? I think it probably is. Um, but, you know, this particular piece of music I thought had something very important in it. And, and it did. I mean, I, I have, I've had people, whenever I've given a concert, people come up afterwards and, and they say, talk about, you know, visions that they've seen or feelings that they've had. And I've even had some people um, 
request to come and lay on the floor underneath the piano while it's being played. Wow. So they can absorb the vibration. So there's there's something about the frequencies of the music that that has to do with healing um, and no, no. and some sort of experience uh, for people. And so everywhere I've been and played, um, I get the same sort of reaction. Um, and and so I after Oliver told me to write it, I did do that. And the following year for the May Sonata group, I played what I call the Lightning Sonata. Um, it's it's actually not a sonata in form. It's a it's a fantasy in form, but it's subtitled the Lightning Sonata. And when I played it, you know, it was well received. Um, and while I was there, Oliver called me and and said, you know, I'd like to use your story in my book that's going to be coming out soon. And I thought, okay, fine. I, you know, I don't have anything to hide. And so the, the chapter one, which was me, um, in the book called Musicophilia, um, came out in the New Yorker magazine in July of 2007. You were outed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he pulled me right out of the closet, no question about it. <laughs> and suddenly everything changed. And and I, I had gotten a call from a friend of mine who was uh, the, the head of music at the State Uni University of New York in Oneonta, um, Carlton Clay. And Carlton um, said, you know, I've, I've read the story in a New Yorker, and I was wondering if you would come and teach a class. And I thought, well, that would be interesting, sure. And then a week later, he calls and he says, well, you know, there seems to be an awful lot of interest in this. Would you consider playing for the class? And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> and a couple of weeks later, he calls back and he says, you know, this is really getting kind of crazy. He said, we were wondering if you would consider doing a concert at the Performing Arts Theater. And I said, I've never done anything like that. I wouldn't know where to begin. And somehow he sucked me into it. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, he calls and he says, oh, by the way, the BBC One, Granada Media and German Television are all going to be there <laughs> to record this. And I thought, oh, my God. I'm in such trouble. I, now I realize I'm way over my head. No, and you're not. I, You've got spirit with you. Boy. Oh, I, I called my piano teacher. and I told her what I had done, and, and I said, can you help me? And so we spent the next number of weeks, you know, four hours a day. Um, she would meet me up at the Performing Arts Theater and, you know, we started right from walking onto the stage to walking off the stage. Oh, wow. You know. I mean, this is basics. Yeah. Oh, you know, how to just how to survive this thing. And uh, but I, you know, I managed to do it um, and we managed to get through the music without screwing it up, and which was a, a big plus for me. Take us to the experience of sitting down to play this music. I mean, the human side of us would think I have to do this. Tell us what you experience when you just get in that flow, like the light you were in. Sure. I, you know, I was, I should have been absolutely terrified. And there were times that I, I really thought that I should run. Um, but I knew that I was not alone. And, and I knew that, you know, I remember having this conversation with with God and my angels, and I, I, you've taken me to this point. You know, I can't imagine it. You'd let me fall on my face and embarrass and, and embarrass you. So, you know, I thought, okay, you know, we're going to get. I'm going to get through it. And and I, as I was there, I knew that I was not alone. And I knew that they would help me. And it was interesting because on when I when I played for the IANS conference one year, 
think it was in 2013, um, there were a bunch of pictures that were being taken. And when I look at the pictures, there are orbs around me. And in particular, there yeah. was there was an orb that was sitting on the piano. And it was actually giving off blue light onto the white keys. And and I have a picture of it. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> and, and it's very clear that, you know, that I have never been alone for any of this journey. And you experience um, yourself as a ball of light like that. That's what's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know who the balls of light were, but it didn't matter yeah. who they were. I just knew that they were there for me. As they are for all of us. Tony, that, that first experience there that you, you practice how to walk on stage and off, is that available on YouTube? Um, no, actually, I never made it into the, I never made a, a YouTube video of it, video of it. That's on my bucket list. Okay. Um, nope. I have all of the I have all of the footage, and um, and I think it would be, an, a good, a good video. So that was the lightning sonata. How much more music flowed after that? Um, it was pretty constant. Oh my! Um, I had, and it was always like it was downloaded into my head in its entirety. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I had a, a dear friend who was a, a neurologist who had died suddenly. And I was very, very taken with it. And I sat down on the piano and this piece of music just dropped into my head um, about the emotional content of, of what had happened as as I came to the realization that he was dead, mm. um, and and that was another piece of music that I wrote. Um, it's called a rhapsody in D minor. It was uh, dedicated to to my friend John, and then there were many other pieces of music that came along as well. And I've got books of things that I haven't finished. Um, that are in different um, different states of of being finished, um, and then it's even gone so far as one time. One day I was I was playing a lesson, um, and as I was playing the lesson, suddenly I'm hearing I'm hearing it in a symphony, and. And I thought, this is really kind of strange. I stopped playing, but the symphony kept going. And so, you know, that's that's on my list of things to finish. Um, well, I, and, I love that you know, this is not a story where suddenly you're playing like a, a concert master. You, you have the music and this vessel had to catch up, you know? Yeah. yeah. So we, unfortunately, we only have about four minutes, three minutes left. Tell us the deeper messages you've gained from all of this what is it why why the music why you okay um i think the music is is a vessel of sorts um that i think can be healing for other people um and can help them to experience some of the feeling that i had um i think there's more to it that i just don't understand um, when I continue to search for that, um, I think that out of this is, has come a, a great understanding of, of consciousness and consciousness is something that exists in the fabric of, of the quantum world and we are all part of it. We are all connected to it in every way. And, and, and that's been proven scientifically. Um, John Bell 
in his famous experiments in 1964, was able to show if you take uh, paired electrons and you put one at one side of the universe and the other at the other side of the universe, and you make one spin to the right, the other will instantaneously spin to the left. And, and no so they have to have, I'm sorry? No separation. Yep. Yeah, there's no separation. And the fact that there's no separation of, of particles on a quantum scale, there's no separation of us on a spiritual scale. And we are all connected. And, and the problem is that we just don't know how to access the information. We don't know how to access each other. Yet we all have the ability. I know how, and that's what my teachings are hopefully going to help people get. And, and you, your, your, sto your stories help us to know that we can all access that state. It's a state of awareness, and you were catapulted into it. The, the, I, the, my biggest takeaway from this is that moment when you stood watching your body and you knew you weren't that body. You are this awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a huge, a huge breakthrough. Yeah, it really was. And, and it was staggering as, as I came to that realization. Well, I hope that you are motivated to finish that book and let us know when it is, because I'll be the first in line to buy it. I want to hear the, the longer story of what you found out from all of this. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. So will you be playing your piano tonight or in the next couple of days we have about 20 seconds you still play regularly i still play regularly you know i try to play every day um some days i win some days i lose all right well everybody look up on youtube and listen to this beautiful music and know it's meant to heal us tony thank you so much for being our guest and sharing this beautiful story of hope with us all you're welcome thank you for inviting me